Well, hey there, I'm Dr. Tom Ulrich, and I like to talk about leadership and engineering. But since you two see these two little guys, you know I'm also going to talk about Scrum. Hey, so um, in this episode, what I want to do is talk about the, the Sprint Retrospective. So the Sprint Retrospective is one of the essential elements of Scrum. And in my observations, so I've been doing Scrum for probably about 16 years. I would say it's the one that is maybe taken the least serious. And uh, while sometimes it can be the most helpful, it a lot of times is done very, very programmatically and sort of you get no value from it. So uh, what I'm going to do then, I'm going to talk about some of the, you know, the Ken Schwaber's insights and Ken Rubin's insights. But I'm going to start with, with some of my own perspective, just having done Scrum for a long time. So my take on the retrospective is there's basically two ways it can go horribly wrong. One is if the whole team is just negative or even if just even one member is just committed to being negative. And the other way is everybody's just always positive, maybe committed to being positive. And, and let me let me uh, elaborate on both those ideas. So the first one concerning uh, either the team or maybe even just the individual who's always negative. Uh, think about this for a second. So I've got my little little Radio Shack um, voltmeter here that I got years ago. And uh, let's suppose I set it on the 20 volt setting. Again, I'm assuming I'm talking mostly to engineers. But so I take this little guy and I, I go to Costco and I buy one of those big things of batteries. So... Uh, I pull one out and I measure it. Now, for those of you not familiar with this, these are these are nominally 1.5 volts, and so if you see a voltage, say below 1.3, you know that's not good. And uh, but don't be alarmed if it's as high as 1.6. At any rate, let's say I pull it out and I measure 0.9 volts on the first one, and I say, okay, well there was one bad one, and then I pull the second one out and I measure 0.9 volts. And then the third one, nine tenths of a volt. Fourth, one. and you know this thing's got forty batteries in it. And let's suppose I go through every single one, and the answer is always nine tenths. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's a bad lot. So as luck would have it, I also bought the thirty-two pack of the uh, AAA. So again, I pull one out, nine tenths of a volt, nine tenths of a volt, nine tenths. All thirty-two of these, nine tenths of a volt. And then I go and I get one of these little guys. Now, if you're not familiar with these, these are supposed to be nine volts. Those are supposed to be one and a half. And I, I put the meter in nine tenths of a volt. And, and then I, I start to get suspicious. So I go out to my car and, you know, the car batteries are 12 volts. So I, I measure the 12 volts and it's nine tenths of a volt. And then I, I just get saucy and I, you know, the, the outlets in the wall are supposed to be 110 volts. And I plug it in and nine tenths of a, of a volt. Somewhere along the way, you're going to start thinking, my meter is broken. And the thing about always being the guy who says, or gal, who's always negative, is what you need to know is, people are like that. If you always are negative, at some point, they treat you like a broken uh, meter. And I've seen it where this kind of has a, a feedback loop where, you know, negative and people listen and then negative and maybe they listen less. And eventually there's so much consistent negative negativity from Bob that people just ignore Bob. And then Bob's getting frustrated that people won't listen to him. And uh, the truth is it's statistically unlikely that nothing positive ever happens. In fact, if you think in your entire life nothing ever happens i mean you've actually got a significant uh you know emotional issue and um uh, so that's the first thing i would say is you know with um being just the guy who's always negative there there's a real downside to that which is you're not going to get taken seriously and you're going to create a situation where you you forfeit all of your influence because you're so committed to being negative now, on the other side, what I've seen happen is people sort of sense that, well, we're doing Scrum, that is what we're doing, and they're almost afraid to say something negative, and that's pretty bad, too. I mean, the whole sort of uh, uh, idea that Scrum lives in is this idea of continuous improvement, and, you know, if, if you feel like 
you can't say anything negative. Uh, something's horribly wrong, and admittedly, it may be out of your control. I mean, you know, I have seen scrum masters who have informed the team that they're going to be very positive in the retrospective and, and so on. But, but uh, so I guess you know, if if you're in a situation like that where you're really being told to be positive, uh, I'm not sure what to say to you. But if you're the scrum master, that does it? I can say to you, you've really forfeited Scrum once you condition your team to only say positive things. All right, so that's that's my big takeaway is those are the two ways retrospectives become meaningless is uh, on the one end, you have one or more people just committed to saying negative things and the other end committed to saying positive. And nor normally in life, there's, there's a mix of negative and positive. And, and especially if you're just thinking everything is negative, um, well, maybe it's just that you live in 2020 during COVID, but but you know, e even then, there there's positives, and that really is a, a very serious symptom if if you can only see negative. All right, so let's check in with Ken Schwaber in his 2009 Scrum Guide. He makes a, a couple uh, comments about the sprint retrospective. First of all, he says always do it before your next sprint planning, and the reason for that is very simple. What he wants you to do is take the actionable items from the sprint retrospective and make them a task on the next sprint. So you've got to have the retrospective first so you can figure out what additional things need to go on that sprint. Uh, the next thing Schwaber says, he says, you know, like so many things in Scrum, we got to put a time box on this thing. And he says to limit them to three hours. And, uh, you know, he is the creator of Scrum and, and he knows a lot more about it than I do, but I gotta tell you, I just cannot imagine, at least with the people I work with, ever having one last that long. I mean, usually by 30 minutes, that's enough time to say what you're thinking, and usually you get a sense that everybody's just sort of begging to be out of there, but um, at any rate, Schwaber says limit them to three hours. Um, I, I do know people who um, allocate about five minutes for a retrospective, and, and that's bad. I mean, I would say half hour is probably the minimum. If nothing else, you want to have to the point where there's, you know, you ought to, okay, what else, what else? It, there ought to be some some periods of quiet or you haven't got to the anywhere near the bottom of the barrel. And Schwaber says, you know, what what sort of things ought, to, ought we to discuss? Well, scrum team composition, and so that can be delicate, but, you know, and there are, there can be sort of neutral things like, you know, we don't have enough testers, we don't have enough developers, we need another person that knows Python, you know, th things like that. Um, it can also be a time to, um, you know, sort of address like when there's a team and one person's really not pulling their weight, that is the time to address it. Now, this doesn't give you a license to kill. So it's not like suddenly you can suspend the rules of civility and just be all mean and you're horrible and all that stuff. But it, it is a time for some honest conversation and saying, you know, I feel like you're not carrying your end of the log and things like that. So not making it all attacking and all that. But but if there is some lingering disappointment, I think you really owe it to the team to to say that. And then when they say that, listen to the response. And, you know, sometimes in those situations, it's like they wish they could do more, but they thought, you know, maybe they interpret your reaction as meaning do less, and, and you may find that you're actually part of that. Uh, other things, other topics, um, you know, meeting arrangements, is the room good? Are we having to stand up in the right spot? Do we have the adequate tools? Have we really defined what done means? I mean, the whole, a big idea of Scrum is you accomplish things in a sprint, and, and when do we say, yes, this has been accomplished? Maybe methods of communication, maybe like, there's not enough communication or, you know, maybe that needs to be in an email or write it on a piece of paper or something. And and even the process for sort of declaring something done, maybe we have a definition of done, but, you know, you kind of, you know, how are we going to do that? How if, if Bob has a task and, you know, do we do we allow Bob just to say, yeah, I, I met I met the definition of done and then I move it? Or do you say, well, no, look, we need to have an independent person look at it and kind of, you know, see what he might have missed. All right, so that's Ken Schwaber's Scrum Guide. Uh, in terms of Schwaber's 2004 book, he has uh, several things on it, but the ones I want to highlight here is he makes the comment, he says, look, the, the retrospective should only be attended by the team, the Scrum Master, and optionally the product owner. 
And he says, managers, absolutely not. And the idea is you, you want to be able to have honest conversations without it sort of ending up on their yearly review. You want to kind of decouple, um, you know, the formal process from, um, uh, you know, from just day to day. And, and of course, there'll be HR people everywhere complaining about this. And the, the thing I think a lot of HR people don't get is, you know, once it's on your formal record, once it's written down, it's a very serious thing. And really, before you say something that is going to be written down in a, in a HR record, you want to really, 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 really make sure you're right. And what you want to do with Scrum is you want to move that needle a little bit. You want to talk about it doesn't feel right. I think we can do better. And it's, you know, you, you kind of say it and then you kind of build in that, well, maybe they'll explain why. And, you know, maybe it ends up being nothing or maybe it's something. But, you know, once there's a manager there, once it ends up in an HR thing or whatever, it it no longer is an informal, you know, continuous improvement thing. It, it becomes sort of a penal thing. And... Um, uh, another thing Schwaber points out is, you know, scrum masters are not there to provide answers. It's not like, okay, we have, we have uh, things on our mind and we expect the scrum master to answer them. That is not what the scrum master is for. The idea is to come up with a list of things they need to work together to solve. So the scrum master is there to facilitate the search for improvement, but not to provide the improvement. Remember, it's a self-organizing team and if you don't have that sense of, yeah, we're empowered, it's us, you know, that's also something's gone horribly wrong. Now, in Ken Rubin's book, uh, he does something I love. He quotes a guy, I think his name's Norm Kurth, and he describes him. I, I'd never heard of this guy, but he describes him as um, the founder of the modern day movement on retrospectives. So sounds like there's a modern day movement that's devoted to retrospectives, I guess. But he quotes something from uh, Winnie the Pooh. So I said, so I'm going to read it. He says, here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now. Bump, 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 bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming downstairs. But sometimes he feels that there's another way. If only he could stop bumping for a moment and think of it. I mean, isn't that hilarious? You know, you've kind of got Christopher Robin dragging his bear and bump, 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 bump his head up, back of his head on the stairs. And, uh, you know, a little bit of the idea here with the retrospective is to stop, slow down, you know, take a minute to think about what's the equivalent of getting just continually bumped in the back of your head. Um, Ruben agrees with something, uh, or actually he says something that's, I, I think, worth repeating. He says, you know, the sprint retrospective is one of the most important and least appreciated practices in the Scrum framework. Um, and... He points out, you know, that the retrospective is kind of the key part of this idea of continuous improvement. You've got to get the feedback before things can change. Now, in terms of who should um, attend, Schwaber said product owners are optional. Ruben says product owners are mandatory. Now, also, uh, Schwaber's initial idea was managers should never be there. And what Ruben says is, well... Uh, Stakeholders, so outside the team, and managers who are not on the Scrum team, uh, they, they can attend, but only if invited. So, you know, if you think about, well, how, how are we going to change this? I mean, maybe the team's feeling like, hey, the manager needs to hear this, the stakeholder needs to hear this. And, and maybe it can be a delicate deal like, hey, the stakeholder's really causing some problems and the manager's causing some problems. We need to sit them down and say, hey, you know, here's what we're thinking. But anyway, any rate, so, so uh, use your judgment there on whether or not to um, uh, invite them. And, and I guess I would point out, you know, Schwaber's 2004 book was kind of the initial work on Scrum. And what Ruben did is he came back, you know, nine years later, and he's incorporated all this learning, and uh, Scrum got more popular. So, you know, if you had to choose Schwaber 2004 or Ruben 2013, I mean, I think you're, you're probably better off with Ruben because he's included all those years of learning. And so the continuous improvement in the process applies to Ruben's book. At any rate, uh, Ruben makes an interesting comment, one that until I read that fairly recently I hadn't ever done, which is, you know, he says there's some pre-work to be done before the retrospective. So he says the Scrum Master ought to think about what's the focus and rather than always saying, well, you know, everything's wide open. And the problem with opening, you know, showing people a blank slate, what do you want to talk about is nobody thinks about anything, you know. But 
he, he kind of, Ruben's idea is, well, pick a topic. Okay, this time we're going to talk about, you know, to what extent are we defining the process before, or the product before we begin? You know, and maybe next time we talk about, let's talk about team composition. And maybe the time after that, let's talk about how much stress we're feeling. Or, you know, uh, come up with a focus. Now, during the retrospective, if something else comes up, you know, of course you can talk about it. But the idea is to sort of prime the pump by giving it thoughtful thing and kind of rotating what the idea is. Um, and, you know, the other thing is if there's some objective data to maybe support some of the things, gather that up. So maybe it's like, you guys are always late. Okay, well, let's show this. Okay, take a little bit of time and, you know, here's kind of our track record and here's our burn downs from the last nine sprints and holy smokes, we are always late. And uh, another thing that's very, very important is for the Scrum Master to set the atmosphere. So I've mentioned in several of my videos, my, my PhD dissertation had to do with the impact of leader of emotions on uh, software testers, as well as on the whole error management culture, sort of the degree to which we're willing to, you know, admit we make mistakes and discuss how to mitigate them and so on. And it's very, very important for the Scrum Master to set the atmosphere and for everybody, you know, uh, to sort of be mindful of the atmosphere and don't let it get to be a wine session, but to really set, you know, set up a safe environment. Um, one thing Ruben says that I just love, and we've done this to some extent, which is he talks about emotions, seismograms. And the idea is kind of like this, you know, especially if you have somebody who's new to your company and maybe your company is real good about admitting there's problems. For sure, some companies that is just a crime to admit, you know, to say there's a problem. But, uh, you know, maybe people are a little bit uncomfortable saying, hey, you know, this is it for whatever reason. See, the idea of an emotional seismogram is you you get everybody thinking in terms of these three faces. And, uh, you know, before COVID, you could, you could uh, you know, have those on the wall and basically say everybody point to the one that, that describes you. What we've been doing <laughs> is we actually all have these things and, you know, from time to time, even in the scrum, you know, everybody hold up your thing. And, and what you do with the seismogram is, you know, maybe in the uh, each retrospective, you, you do that and you count. So this guy, happy face, is a, a, counts for two points. Yellow counts for one point. Uh, red counts for zero points. And then take the average and plot them sprint over sprint so at the end of sprint one the end of sprint two the end of sprint three and look for trends and you know what's the right answer i don't know but the idea is if it suddenly changes that's something to discuss like why you know what made this go up what made this go down at any rate so that's kind of a fun idea and uh you know he also suggests that if you um, like if before covid what you would do is maybe write them on a piece of paper on the wall and do a dot vote, which is everybody gets one of those little sticky colored dots. And, and, you know, so let's say you've identified nine issues, just say, give everybody one dot and say, Hey, go, go put your dot on the issue that you think's the biggest one. And, you know, people just get to go put their in the, and, you know, in some cases what'll happen is the dots are evenly spread in which nothing's, you know, like, okay, nothing's really standing out. But in other cases, you know, this will really bring into focus, like, Hey, this is a problem. Uh, he also says to maintain an, an insight backlog. Um, so it's kind of a backlog like the product backlog, except it's just sort of processy things. Some people say, no, just put that in the in the actual product backlog. But one way or another, you know, you go to all this trouble to have a retrospective, write them down and keep that. And uh, as a final thing, one thing Ruben says that I, I really like, he says he has a section on things that go wrong. And he says, you know, and this gets back to my very first comment. He says, you know, one of the worst things that can go wrong is if a team believes it's achieved a perfect scrum and like there's really nothing else to improve. And that itself is showing that the idea of continuous improvement has gone horribly wrong. Well, when I was at first at Park Aerospace years ago, I had a friend uh, who I knew, he, you know, my son was in Cub Scouts, his son was in Cub Scouts of the same uh, group. And so we, you know, got to know each other. And he was responsible for lean and all those things at Parker. And uh, he made a comment to me. He, he uh, basically said, you know, as soon as you write down a process, it's obsolete. There's no such thing as a non-obsolete process. 
because things ought to be continually changing. So you spend all this time, you write it down, you release it, you think you got it, and you got to start thinking, okay, it's, it's still not right. What do we need? And, and that's a very important mind frame is to realize process can never be perfect. You always have to sort of evolve it. Hey, at any rate, so those are my thoughts on the sprint retrospective. Uh, hey, if you'd like to see more videos on Scrum, uh, you can go to my website, TomAlrichConsulting.com. Uh, if you'd like to find my um, other videos, same thing. Also, you can go to uh, uh, YouTube and just type in Dr. Tom Ulrich. Hey, could you give me a like? Could maybe leave me a comment? Subscribe would be amazing. And uh, if there's something you'd like me to talk on, go ahead and tell me, and I'll, I'll listen to that. And there's several videos I've made now that have been in responses. At any rate, that's all I've got for now. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.